My name is Alex, and uh, I manage a, uh, an applied research group uh, focusing on natural language processing <coughs> problems at the Amazon Development Center Germany. And today, uh, what I'd like to do is, is give you a sample uh, of the kind of work that we do in my group and elsewhere in, in Berlin um, to just kind of tell you how, how ubiquitous machine learning um, is uh, across um, the company. So... Um, so this was uh, us in 1998. Um, so we started by selling books. Uh, somebody had an idea to make internet more useful for, for our customers. And of course, we've grown since then, but the fundamental focus on, on customers is, is really part of our, uh, our DNA across the company, and machine learning is really no exception. <coughs> so fast forward 20 years or so, um, and so you can now come to the sites to, to do many different things. You could uh, listen to music, you could uh, read books, you could uh, shop, you could sell, uh, you could uh, build uh, new experiences on top of AWS services. Um, and so there are kind of many different, uh, uh, many different customers and many different use cases um, that we are now. So... Um, so our customers, uh, are, we have four categories of customers. Uh, so the first one is, is consumers. So these are people like you and me. Uh, come, to websites, uh, come to the websites to shop, to, uh, to, uh, to watch videos, to play music, etc. So we have about uh, over 300 million active uh, um, customer accounts. So machine learning there, an example, uh, could be um, recommendations. Uh, another category of, of customers are sellers. Um, so they uh, uh, rely on, on Amazon infrastructure and logistics to sell, um, to sell on Amazon. Um, and they account for about 50% of, of units that we sell. So an example of machine learning there is our automatically generated nudges or emails that, allow, that help our um, third-party sellers manage their inventory. Um, and then uh, we have another category of customers who are, are businesses and developers who use uh, AWS services to, to build uh, a new customer experiences. And so machine learning is, is uh, you can see uh, in, in recent uh, uh, services like SageMaker and machine translation. Um, I'll talk about machine translation towards the end of the talk. That's, that's um, where my group spends quite a bit of its efforts. Okay, so <clears throat> one way to, you might have seen this in earlier talks, but one way to, uh, uh, to have a mental model for, for, um, for Amazon is, is um, the Amazon flywheel. And so the idea here is that um, everything starts with the customer experience, um, which is driven by selection and convenience on the site. Um, in turns, it generates uh, traffic, more people come um, and more traffic means um, uh, more sellers are uh, uh, willing to sell uh, on Amazon, and that in turn improves selection and convenience and really drives, drives how, how we grow. Um, and then the growth allows us to optimize uh, uh, and lower our cost structure and pass the savings to, uh, to our customers, which then in turn adds to customer experience and helps to spin this, this flywheel. And so machine learning, uh, it, it really affects uh, most of this picture. So I, I you know, hopefully you can see, so the green arrows there um, are examples of where machine learning, uh, machine learning is. So, um, so for the rest of the talk, what I'd like to do is to give you a, <clears throat> a set of concrete examples where we work on machine learning in, in my group and elsewhere in, in Berlin. So they range from, from uh, applications in, that involve computer vision to natural language processing um, uh, to sort of fundamental problems in machine uh, learning, et cetera. So uh, like I said earlier, I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time on machine translation towards the end of the talk. OK, so let's get started. Um, so X-Ray, um, the, the, the goal of X-Ray is to enrich every piece of digital content that we have to create new, new customer experiences. So for X-Ray for Kindle, um, if you haven't seen this feature, um, what's, what it allows you to do is 
uh, look at characters that are present in the book, um, uh, figure out where they're mentioned in the book, um, and also see their descriptions or definitions of the, of the characters. So it's kind of, it gives you sort of a different perspective on, on, on the book, right? It's not just, a, so you, you don't just read from, uh, uh, sequentially from start to end. You can take a different look at it. So, so obviously you can't really uh, uh, scale this uh, by manual annotation. We have millions of books in, in the catalog and thousands are added every day. So, so manually annotating every mention of characters in, in the book um, is simply, um, simply uh, impossible. So, um, so that's one example of where machine learning helps. Um, in my team, we build algorithms that uh, learn, learn to discover uh, mentions of characters in, in books, and then also learn to cluster different, different kind of mentions that refer to the same, the same character, and then map that to, to a description of, of a person. So, so machine learning there allows us to, to scale and automatically annotate uh, books with this sort of, um, sort of information. And so <clears throat> we can take this further. Um, so one idea is what if we can actually understand and model the plot of the book and what happens in the book. Um, and so one of the, uh, one of the ideas that we proposed is to model it by, by, by model individu modeling individual characters along with relations between pairs of characters and sort of see how that changes and progresses uh, throughout the book. So if you have a representation like this, uh, one thing you could do um, is, is find books that are similar um, to the, the book you're looking at in terms of actual plots, in terms of actual content. So, so here's, so here's a, a kind of a, a simple test. Uh, what you can do is, is select a few books, then look through the rest of your catalog, and then so, uh, and sort of rank order um, the, uh, the books as to sort of from more to less relevant. So you, here's an example of, of this um, uh, on my slide. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, four different books, and in each row, you see other books that are sort of from, less to, from more to less relevant um, uh, 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 to that book. So, so, and so you, you can kind of, you're starting to see some, some interesting things. For example, um, the second line here contains uh, books from different authors, from Charles Dickens and, uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Hardy. Uh, both of them are, were known for a specific style of writing and specific themes. Um, so uh, they, they wrote novels focusing on, on class and social changes. So the, the model is picking up on that, it's, and it's kind of interesting. So, so um, uh, just to, uh, to let you know, um, these blue boxes in, in, uh, uh, on the top right corner of the slide, I'm going to have them throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, they refer to publications that you could, you could uh, uh, look up and, and read if you'd like to find out more. And so these are from my group, from el other groups in Berlin, and also outside of, outside of uh, uh, Amazon. Okay, so, <coughs> so this was uh, X-ray for books but we also have it for, um, for videos. And what it means there is, if you've watched a video on Amazon, uh, you have this experience, ex additional kind of experience where you, for every scene that you're watching, you see a list of characters that are present in the scene uh, together with the actors that are playing those characters. So you can go and explore more about the scene. You can, you can look up uh, individual characters and, and, and actors on IMDb. Um, you can also, uh, the, the movie is organized in, in scenes, and the scenes have descriptions of the, of the scenes, so you can navigate, navigate the movie and understand it better. I'd say if you took a pause and you come back and you'd like to pick up where you left off, um, it's, it's easy to do that. So, um, so again, um, Annotating each one of these movies manually is, is difficult, right? So, so machine learning helps us scale. So learning algorithms allow, allow us to add this additional annotation uh, learned from examples um, automatically. So in, in this scene selection, um, for example, or scene segmentation, for example, we use uh, uh, neural networks to, to tell us where the scene ends and the new scene begins. Okay, so, so that was the second example. Um, another example that's a little bit more in, in our area, that's uh, uh, review moderation. <clears throat> so here, uh, the uh, idea is, is we'd like to make 
custom reviews more informative for, for customers that are coming to shop to find out more about uh, uh, an item that they're considering purchasing. So, so we'd like to flag um, reviews, for example, containing offensive material or that are off, uh, off topic. Um, and, and we'd like to do this automatically. Being able to do this by, uh, manually is difficult. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had already had hundreds of thousands of reviews submitted daily uh, in, in the US alone. So doing this manually is just simply simply impractical. And so here, the, you know, it's a text classification problem that, uh, that uh, a machine learning system looks at text uh, and, and decides whether or not to, to flag it um, or, or leave it alone. So in the same space of, of, um, of NLP, um, another problem uh, is, uh, is sentiment analysis. Here, uh, uh, given a chunk of text, we'd like to estimate or, or quantify um, the attitude of a writer towards, towards the subject that they're writing about, some topic or theme. So for example, in, in customer reviews, uh, people describe what, what their experiences with, with, uh, with the products were, and we'd like to be able to understand uh, what the, where the, whether or not they were happy about the products or their experience with it or, or not. So, uh, so that's called sentiment analysis, and uh, it's available in, 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 as uh, uh, text analytic uh, uh, APIs in, in, in Amazon Comprehend already. <clears throat> so that's, again, here, machine learning plays a, plays a key role because you, you want to be able to, to sort of process all these, re all these reviews and understand your customer better so you can, you can optimize their, their experience. Okay, switching. Here's to a new example. Um, this is Prime Photos. So, so uh, this is where you can upload your pictures, and you know people carry phones with them, and they snap a lot of pictures. You, it, you know you don't have to uh, develop them anymore, so it's it's easy to just take a lot. So, um, so the goal here is to help you organize uh, them and search through them and and sort of. Uh, um, manage them basically. So, so machine learning problems there are um, understanding and, and classifying uh, s types of scenery, um, um, uh, discovering and recognizing faces and animals and, and other objects in, in, the, in the pictures. And then so, so here uh, the idea would be that if, if we have this information uh, uh, we can help you organize uh, and search through, uh, through your photos. <coughs> So, so that's another application of computer vision problems. Um, <clears throat> in computer vision space, another example is, uh, is um, uh, automatic image quality assurance. Um, so here again, what we'd like to do is uh, we'd like to provide a consistent experience for, uh, for our customers. So when they come to the site, um, uh, we'd like to have, you know, sort of have the consistent experience through um, uh, as they browse through the catalog. So, so, for example, we'd like to find and flag uh, uh, pictures that contain non-white backgrounds, that contain offensive material, uh, or contain or missing the actual products, but contain a, a drawing instead. So, so all of these are kind of non-ideal, right? And, and you want to be able to to automatically discover and flag them. <clears throat> so that's that's another computer vision um, classification problem that's that you'd like to be able to solve. Um, Another uh, uh, thing we could do in the, in the same computer vision space is <coughs> uh, looking at images, uh, discover uh, uh, attributes that may be missing from product description. So if we look at, if we look at, a, at a picture of a, of a hiking boot, uh, as humans, we see that it has shoelaces, it has a particular kind or shape, uh, and and we may be able to, to in, in infer that it's good for, for a particular activity like day hikes. And so being able to do that automatically uh, um, with using computer vision could also I enable and improve experiences where you can browse and search for items that you'd like to, to buy by describing the use case or experience that you need them for. So, so we can match you better to, uh, to the right set of, um, set of potential candidates. Okay. <clears throat> so. So we can take this even further um, and, and say, well, can we think of uh, kind of what can we do to, to, to invent a next uh, uh, kind of 
new experience for browsing and, and, and searching for products. And so, so an ambitious task could be, what, can we actually understand uh, fashion and style and somehow model and predict it? And so, uh, so another group in, in, in Berlin has built a model to, uh, to look at images and capture uh, uh, kind of intrinsic features of the image, convert it into a representation that could be used uh, to measure similarities between pairs of images. Um, uh, and then, so, so an example of that is, uh, I have a couple of slides here. Sorry. Okay, so an example here is uh, given an image of a dress, uh, the, uh, uh, the algorithm allows you to score uh, the entire catalog and pick up m similar or most similar uh, uh, images according to that representation that it learns. And so, so here, the interesting thing you could see is that the dresses it selects are, uh, some, some of them are similar in terms of style, other, one, uh, other ones are similar in terms of pattern, and so they're kind of non-trivial things that, that it captures that, uh, that are uh, indicative of, of style or some stylistic uh, um, variation. Another example of the same algorithm is the drawing of a face. Uh, again, if you uh, uh, convert uh, these images to, to, to these learned representations, you can score um, uh, similarities across them and learn and, and discover uh, relevant pictures. So here's an example of, of a drawing of a face, but a uh, um, but different face. And, and so, okay, so in the same space of um, computer vision, uh, you might have heard of the, the, the Amazon picking challenge. So here, um, the idea is, uh, one of the challenges is to, to pick items from a tote um, and Machine learning plays a key role there. Uh, if, you, if you look at a toad and a bunch of objects in there, your computer vision algorithm uh, uh, could be used to, uh, to understand the shapes, the positions, potentially the materials, so they, they could be grabbed, uh, 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 these, these items could be grabbed in the correct, correct way, in the correct order uh, um, from the toad. So here again, computer vision plays, plays an important, important role. Okay, moving to a very different example. Um, so here, um, uh, that's uh, here. The, the problem that uh, uh, that I'd like to talk about next is is predicting, um, uh, forecasting product demand. So, so uh, ideally, what we'd like to uh, to do is to, whenever a person orders uh, an item on the Amazon site, is to be able to fulfill that order. So we we'd like to have these items in stock, but we don't have too many of them in stock because we're wasting, uh, wasting valuable um, uh, space in the fulfillment centers. So we'd like to be able to, to, to forecast or predict uh, customer demand. And so why is this difficult? <coughs> well, so it turns out that many of the products are bought infrequently um, uh, with, for products such as fashion items or jewelry. Um, um, it's pretty hard to predict fashion trends if you uh, introduce a new item in the catalog that that's, uh, you've never seen before, you don't really have past history to be able to learn from to make predictions about future, future purchases. There's seasonality and, and a whole bunch of other complicating factors. So, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult but extremely important uh, machine learning task is to based on, on, on what you know about the product is to predict um, how um, and how much it will be in demand. <clears throat> okay, next example is, is um, <clears throat> um, on, on what we call deep content understanding. So here I'm showing an example of a, of a backpack and, and given a, a, a snippets from three different customer reviews that uh, are on the site uh, that customers wrote about the backpack. So if you look at this for a little while, um, you might be able to tell that two first two customers are telling us something about this backpack being great for extended hikes. <clears throat> but for you as a human to be able to make that inference, you need to know that AT most likely refers to the Appalachian Trail, 
which is a really long trail and it takes multiple days to traverse. So, so once you know that, then you can, you can understand that this person sort of recommending the, the backpack for, for extended hikes. The second person basically tells that explicitly. And so um, if you look at it some more, uh, you should be able to tell that the second and third person are probably telling us about uh, this backpack being comfortable in, in warm climates. So, so here again, to be able to make that conclusion, you need to know that both Texas and Southern California are states with, uh, with warm climate. Uh, and so, so it, but if you could do that, um, then um, you can sort of capture the, 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 um, the experiences that people are describing in their, in their reviews and use them to, to better match uh, um, what customers are looking for to the products that we have. But that requires a, a fair amount of understanding of the meaning of the text that's, um, that's captured in those reviews. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, so far I told you about uh, a bunch of different applications and, and they all use different algorithms. And, um, and the, the one thing that that's, uh, uh, is true across all of them is that they all, or mostly, depend on, on, um, on what's called metaparameters. So for neural networks, for example, it's uh, 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 the kind of architecture uh, that the model has, uh, learning parameters, uh, what's your sopping criteria when you train, when you decide that it's, the model is good enough. And so, and so these are extremely expensive to, to explore, explore fully. So, so generally, these are tuned by, uh, by uh, uh, human experts. So, so these are the people who understand uh, uh, machine learning and understand uh, the problem so they can, they can sort of uh, uh, suggest good values for these metaparameters. And so, and so that's obviously a, a, a bottleneck, right? You need to have an expert to help you tune these, um, uh, these models. So the goal for one of the teams is, is to, to learn those, those automatically. Um, uh, so you can think of it as sort of meta machine learning algorithm that learns parameters of other, other algorithms. And so this is uh, available uh, already at, uh, as a part of SageMaker. You could use it today. Okay, good. So, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and focus on, on machine translation. That's uh, uh, an area where a large portion of my team has spent considerable efforts in. So um, I don't really need to convince this audience that machine or translation in general is difficult, right? Uh, uh, most of you, all of you are probably at least bilingual speakers. So, uh, so you, you, you probably can, can understand that that's, uh, uh, that's translating from one language to another is a complicated problem, right? You, you need to model morphology. You need to, be, uh, you need to understand differences in the word order. Uh, words are intrinsically ambiguous. Um, they have multiple senses or meaning. And which are resolved by the context in which they appear. Uh, there's gender, there's case, there's a whole bunch of other, um, other complexities that depend on, on, on a language. And so, <clears throat> so it's a difficult problem. And, and uh, uh, to solve it, really, we, we care about two, um, two aspects. One is uh, we want to, given a sentence in, in a source language and a translation in a target language, we want to make sure that the meaning is preserved from source to target. Um, and the other uh, aspect is fluency. We want to ensure that the, uh, the target sentence that we produce is, is, is fluent. So it, it reads as if it was generated by, by fluent native speaker. Okay, so, so then why do we care about machine translation uh, at Amazon? Well, we have a, a lot of text in, in multiple languages, uh, but one specific example is, is uh, product pages. So, so here, uh, what we'd like to do is, is to translate product pages. Uh, and uh, if you uh, uh, look at one of these pages, the, the three chunks of text uh, that we need to uh, translate are titles, uh, uh, a series of bullet points or kind of highlights of product features, and also um, kind of a free form uh, a product description at the end. And it, what makes it complicated is that what we really are after is that the entire page, including, including the product image, um, allows um, uh, our customers to make as informed a purchasing decision as possible. So we want to make sure that the person knows as much about the product as possible. 
So we care about, uh, uh, we care specifically about uh, certain things. Uh, for example, if you look at the title, uh, uh, you see uh, what's called named entities, so names of uh, uh, brands or names of uh, uh, products. We also have potentially color, uh, sizing information, so, so we want to be able to get those, those right, right? If we, you order a shoe of a particular size and it was a translation mistake, you get it in a different size, you, you aren't going to be happy. So, okay, then, uh, then how do we do this then? Um, okay, before I jump into, into actual machine translation, I'm going I'm to start with, a, with a, uh, a different problem of language modeling. So one way to look uh, at the problem um, could be that uh, you, you, you'd like to have a model that scores the fluency of your, of your sentences. So if a sentence is generated by a native, fluent native speaker, you want the model to give you uh, a high score. And if it's just some random permutation of words in a sentence, then you want the model to give you a low score. <coughs> so for the same uh, uh, length of sentences, one way to do this is to, to, um, to capture this by probability, uh, 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 to describe it with a probability distribution. So, uh, and so the idea is that you, you're, 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 uh, you'd like to assign a higher probability mass to, to sequences that are, that are fluent, they sound like native speakers, and low uh, scores to, to, to uh, kind of random permutations. Okay, so, so one way then to, to, uh, uh, to write it up is, is to decompose it into sequences of tokens. You, you go from, from left to right, and you write up uh, probabilities of individual tokens given the context of, of all the words up to the point. So this is a, a simple chain rule. Um, and then, so if that's the way we want to look at it, then, uh, then how would we score uh, fluency? So let's look at an example sentence, the White House and we'd like to, to, compute, uh, to compute its fluency score. So the way it's done in, in recurrent uh, language models is you start with um, some start symbol, so there's a kind of a reserved symbol that indicates the start of sentence. You uh, look up, uh, you basically map it to, uh, to real uh, multidimensional real valued vector, or otherwise uh, uh, called embedding. And so you can think of it as, as, a, as a basically lookup dictionary that indexes words against their, um, their uh, uh, um, uh, embedding. Um, next, you compute uh, your uh, hidden uh, layer. So, so these are basically just recurrent functions. They could be any, any kind of recurrent function that takes uh, an, uh, an input as input uh, word representation for the current type step, as well as the hidden uh, um, uh, representation from the previous time step. Um, then uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take your, your, your representation of, of the word, and then you're going to um, uh, generate a distribution of the next word um, in the sentence. So if the word, if I'm starting with the word start, I'm going to basically get a probability distribution of all the words in my vocabulary uh, with words that are more likely to follow start, having more probability mass, and, and the ones that are less likely to, have, uh, to follow start have uh, less probability mass. And, so, and then you're going to basically repeat this for the, for the next time step. You're going to take the next word there. You're going to convert it to, to hidden representation. You're going to compute your probability distribution over the next word. Um, and then basically read off of that probability distribution the, the value that you, that you want for your product um, there on the top left corner. And you're going to keep, keep doing this and until, you're, until you're finished with the sentence. Okay, so that's how, um, that's one way to, to do this. That's how recurrent language models um, um, do this. So if you have these models, uh, one um, thing you can use them for is to actually generate or dream up uh, new sentences that the model thinks are, are fluent. So the way you do this is, is pretty straightforward. You do the same. You start with a start, start symbol. You look up its, its embedding. Uh, you compute its hidden um, um, uh, representation. And then you, you convert it into probability distribution. And then from that probability distribution, you pick some word, probably the one that has the most mass. You give it as an input to the next time step. Uh, you generate the next word and the next word and then until you're done. 
So, so you could use these things to, to, to dream up new sentences. Okay, so, so what does it have to do with, with machine translation? Um, so it turns out that one of the uh, most influential ideas uh, from a few years back is kind of in a simple extension of, of, of what I just told you. So, so here in the setup, we're, we're now translating from a, a word, uh, from a, a, a sentence in, in Spanish to a sentence in, in English. So we're going to do pretty much what I just told you uh, in the last two slides, except for we're not going to generate anything. We're just going to kind of encode it. Um, we're going to go through left to right until we get to the end of the sentence. So that's our Spanish, Spanish sentence. So the one thing to note here is that blue square at the end sort of packs in all the meaning uh, of, of the sentence uh, that we've seen so far, right? Then what I'm going to do is start uh, generating uh, a, a sentence in a new language, in English. And what I will do is uh, I'm going to take that, that sort of packed meaning, packed into, into that last blue square, and, and use it as a starting point when generating, when decoding uh, into the new language. So, um, so I'm going to basically start with that, uh, with, that, uh, with that blue square. And then the rest is the same. I'm going to generate the, ne the next word. Uh, I'm going to pick a word from from the probability distribution. I'm going to give it as input to the next time step, um, et cetera, et cetera. So one way to look at this would be uh, that it's basically a language model that's conditioned on that sort of last blue square, right, in addition to, to each word in the sequence. And so I just kind of threw around these terms, encode, decode, um, and this is basically what they're called. Um, the left-hand side is called encoder, the right-hand side is called a, a decoder, and, and this is uh, uh, kind of a general big picture of, of uh, neural encoder-decoder uh, architecture. Okay, so, so one thing you might be asking yourself is, is what I'm suggesting here is that at the end, my last uh, 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 word in, in my sentence generates the, 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 this hidden representation that packs the meaning of the entire sentence. So, so what, what happens if, the, if these sequences, the sentences, are, are, are extremely long, right? Um, and that would be a good question to ask. In fact, that was the idea or inspiration for, for, the, for the extension of these models that are called attention mechanisms. Um, so here, the idea is that when we look at the source sentence, we're going to, and then we, we're generating nth word in the target language, we're going to allow our model to cheat a little bit and, and basically l uh, peek at, at representations of the words in the, in the, in the source sentence. Um, and the amount of peaking or the amount of uh, uh, um, the weight of, or, or of the detention is going to be learned, is going to be decided by the model. And so, for example, if we generate the word white, um, uh, the model is going to be able to, to look up at the sequence uh, 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 of the of these blue squares for the, for the source language sentence and pick and choose the ones that it cares about more. So in this case, the thicker arrow, arrow indicates uh, the more attention to the word Blanca, which, which translates to word, to word um, white. Okay, um, good. So, so I, talked to, I just wanna say a couple of words about decoding or translation. So I, I talked a little bit about how you could generate a, a new uh, sentence, uh, I said that you, every time step, you, you look at the probability distribution and then you pick some word, either you take the one with the largest mass or you sample from the distribution. But, um, but then what fundamentally happens every time you, you, you generate a word, you commit to that word, right? So you make a greedy local decision that if, if, you, if, you're, if you're a little bit off, may generate a translation that's not as good as it, it could have been. <coughs> so the the other extreme of this could be, well, wh why not just go and explore the entire uh, uh, space of potential translations? You can look at all the sentences in, in the target language and then score them and see, see how, uh, pick the best one, basically, according to the model. And that, of course, is, is impractical. That's difficult to do. So, so in practice, what happens is we do something in between that's called uh, a beam search. So, so what you do is uh, at every time step, you keep uh, uh, K hypothesis, um, and then at every next time step, you sort of decide which ones to keep, which ones to add, and that allows you to look at the, at the kind of a beam or part of, of your search space, and um, that parameter K, the size of your beam, allows you to make a trade-off between 
uh, kind of the amount of compute you'd like to, uh, you, you can spend uh, exploring your search space versus the translation quality of, of, uh, of the, uh, or the amount of, of search space that you, that you can consider um, while searching. Okay, so, um, so what we did is we went and uh, out and implemented our, our own neural machine translation toolkit called Sakai. Um, the goal of the toolkit was really to make it easy to, um, to, comp uh, to, to add algorithmic improvements and architectural changes and, and fairly compare them uh, across different uh, kind of different ideas. So we've implemented uh, the, uh, the RNNs with attention, the, the models that I've just uh, that I've briefly described. Um, there are also two other um, sort of common uh, big ideas, uh, transformer and convolutional models, um, along with, uh, with countless training and inference features that, uh, that you could play with. And it's also production grade, so, so you can grab uh, you know, a large data set, uh, a P3 instance on, on AWS, spend a few days, and, and you have a kind of production quality model that you could use for translation. So um, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're happy to see it's it, it being used, and uh, internally it's used in, in several different places. Uh, so one example is uh, SageMaker. Um, another is the product localization use case that I've showed you. Um, other use cases include semantic parsing, so that those are the problems where you, you want to take a string and you turn it into some uh, um, structured meaning representation that you could act on. You could, you could use it to compare sentences or uh, answer questions, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, our, our biggest um, use case is, is Amazon Translate, so that's a, a AWS service that was launched um, last year, the at last year's reInvent, and so uh, we we're constantly improving these models. We're adding new new language pairs, and and uh, happy to see uh, to see this uh, the service being used. Um, so one thing I sort of alluded to, but I wanted to make explicit is that it's a uh, the toolkit's an, an open source toolkit. Um, it's released under Apache 2.0, um, and it's really it machine translation is the is the big use case we started with. But it's not just for machine translation. So every problem that you can you can turn into uh, inducing one sequence from another, um, you, you could try and and, and uh, learn a model using Sakai. So one exa one other example is the named entity recognition um, that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, is where you start with a sentence and you want to learn annotations of en of entities, um, names and locations in your sentence. So that, that's an example of sequence-to-sequence -sequence task that you could use a Sakai uh, for. Um, there's also quite a bit more detail in the archive paper here in the top right corner that's, that we've published um, this year. Okay, good. Um, so I'm coming to closer to the end of my talk. So, um, so what I, the takeaway really um, I, uh, from this talk, I, I think, is, is that um, Machine learning has is, is really been transformational. It's used all over the company. It's, uh, it's extremely important for us to, to be able to scale and to invent and come up with new experiences. Uh, virtually every group at, at Amazon have, has, has uses, it, uses machine learning in one form, form or another. Um, uh, the, another important point I wanted to make is that I think we're kind of at a time where machine learning is really being democratized. You, you don't have to be an expert with a PhD to be able to, to use and run these algorithms. Um, the tools are m mature enough and, and, and um, uh, uh, useful enough that you could, you could do it without having t uh, uh, um, an expert degree in, in machine learning. So, so SageMaker is one example uh, of, of those tools. Um, to conclude, uh, just wanted to kind of show you where um, where machine learning at Amazon is, really, it's kind of all over the place. Um, I, all these problems that I mentioned in, in the talk are, are um, something that that's, uh, various groups in, at the Amazon Development Center Germany and Berlin work on, but there are other examples here in the picture of other locations and, and what's being done there, so it's by no means an exhaustive list. Um, so why are we so distributed? Well, turns out uh, uh, experts are um, kind of a, um, a supply of experts is limited, so, so we go where the experts are and, and we build teams and 
uh, and experts attract other people and, and that's, how it, that's how it goes. So um, with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any questions for Alex? Oh. Uh, regarding machine translation, mm -hmm. how do you obtain training data? Can you give us some few examples for a few parts? Um, I can't really give you an exhaustive list, but the training data that we use is, is uh, a bilingual text, right? It's, uh, it's basically uh, 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 for, for, for a pair of languages that you want to train a machine learning model for, your, your, the resources that you need are, are um, ideally uh, sentence-aligned or paragraph-aligned uh, uh, text where uh, you know, a, a sentence or a paragraph corresponds to, uh, to a human translation of it in a different language. So, so you basically fundamentally need, need, need that type of training data to learn patterns, uh, translation patterns from. Yeah, but uh, you need a lot of data, and it's really hard to have that, that kind of data. So I'm yeah. just wondering the real example for, like, let's say, Spanish English language. Uh, yeah, I mean, so there's there's open source data that's available specifically for machine translation, and we we do quite a bit to to create and generate new data, collect new data. So I can't can't get too much into into details. Ah, uh, so you cannot get into much details. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we'll stop here. In case you will have questions, Alex stays with us, so he will be also open yeah. for questions offline. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you again, Alex. Thank you. Thank you.